One of the things we talk about quite often, and it throws people when we get those phone calls from insurance people, you know, there's always people trying to sell life insurance. And um, they always ask, said, no, we've got our own insurance sort of system. And they say, what is that? So then I launch into this <laughs> discussion of how all the stuff in our life is about insurance. All the things we do is about insuring our life, like not using toxic materials and eating organic food. And having and good relationships. Having good relationships and spending Extended time with family. our children and um, working towards all these other things that we try to do. They're all part of that same thing, and that's mm. that's actually our insurance. And they sort of okay, hang up. They just go, <laughs> okay, where's the learning button? If it's not fun, well, <laughs> you're much better at that side than I am. I get a bit serious. <laughs> How do you get serious about it? Oh, I get very serious about all these things that we need to do and the ways we need to be. And <laughs> Disconnection's a word of our age, eh? Everything's disconnected and, and made into... deconstructed into small areas. But we're trying to put the connections back together. You know, business, family life, education, health, all those things, they all fit in. Being aware of the impacts of all the things. Mm. You need a bit of time for that, actually. It's something we have to work quite hard at as well, because we mm. run out of that too. Yeah. You need time to let things settle and to, uh, to let things... If you're rushing around, it's the biggest excuse you can make to never being conscious and never doing anything on the planet at all that's going to do anything. Um, okay, so, well, you can see there telephone poles, pretty obvious. They went in first. <laughs> and then some, you can see the exposed uh, beams at the top, and they go all the way around the house. It's very high in the front, so all the winter sun is gathered and, you know, um, and then goes onto the clay wall inside the house. And that's a solar battery. And then this, so this is the stone wall, this is Rangatike stone, it's the, I think it's the closest river that has stone to here. There's no stones in the Manawatu River, so uh, we tried to keep it as local as we could. This stone's Gabion stone, they use for um, erosion control, baskets of it in the Manawatu Gorge. And if we have a look over here, there's an unfinished wall, and you can see behind here there's a, there's a concrete core, it's painted black with a waterproof emulsion. So there's a core about this wide of concrete that's reinforced. Then the stone's clad on the outside and then on the inside there's, there's cordwood which is logs of wood plastered in place. So um, yeah, we had to do that for earthquakes and so it was quite a difficult wall to build. It looks simple in the end but then it's topped with a slate which we managed to pick up from someone who had a bit left over from their house. And you've also made a commitment that you're only going to work with natural materials. Yeah, yeah. So um, any building jobs that Duncan does, he only works with I'll untreated work with timber some. and natural yeah. materials. So mm -hmm. he won't, because other you know, people have asked him to help build things, but um, if they want to use treated timber or other stuff, yeah. he just says no, find someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is, amazingly, this is cedar, western red cedar grown in Pahangana, about 80 kilometres from here. Um, yeah, so it's nice to get that, which has got a natural um, deterrent, natural um, pest deterrent. It smells, so when you're cutting it, it smells like incense. I think that acts as a deterrent, nothing really likes to eat it. So it's really nice wood. If you want to build a house in six weeks, you Environmentally, can. you can, but you need 700,000, you know. Mm. But if you want to build one in a little bit more time, you can start to collect materials when you see it, you know, all this. Hey, someone's got a whole load of something. And so we were collecting materials a long time Four before years. we started. Mm. Um, I was a teacher at a school and they were throwing these green ones. They threw out about 40 of them. They are down that end as well. See the green ones on the top? I said, where are you guys taking those? Oh, they're all going to throw them away. What? <laughs> they're all in Matai framing and 
I'm going to throw them in the dump. So I grabbed those. Uh, some are second hand bought. These ones up the top I made. So the big ones in the middle, I made those myself. I didn't make the glass, of course. We, did we tilt that back for any reason? No, just mainly visual. Because the, the, I've seen a lot of passive solar houses from um, places where it's freezing. You know, a lot of passive solar design comes from places where it's you know, snow in winter and it's baking in summer. And, and, and they look really heinously ugly. Look like a huge, like a big glass house. So. I want just, just to relieve the, relieve the sheerness of the front. So, mostly aesthetic, leaning that back. Permittable. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we went right through the process. If you're going to finance your house, if you're going to get a loan, it's got to have permits and all that sort of thing. So we were kind of... But it is permittable, which means it's probably resellable. That's the other good thing about it. And, and councils will chase you now if you haven't got um, permits and you know they've got satellite shots of houses and telling people to pull things down so no it's all it's all kosher this one and I, I want it to be safe you know I mean that I said to the council hey um do you think I do you think I don't want to build a safe house for my family I think it's good to have standards and to have proper engineering and yeah we got an engineer involved for aspects of this house like the trombe wall in the middle the big heat sink wall we got an engineer to do the structural details of that, um, you know, because it's 25 tonne, 30 tonne wet. So you don't, you don't want your, your slab or anything break, you know, it's a lot of load to bear. If that sags, the roof sags and, you know. Hmm. Come around here. Um, <clears throat> now, the, this is the southern wall, so it's a colder wall. So that the, the detail on the front of the house down low is a very cold detail. It's got no, not much insulation in that. You've got stone, stone, concrete. So this wall has got an air gap, an insulated air gap. So the, it's actually got a wooden frame in there. And then there's an, so there's an air gap in the wooden frame, framing. It's clad on the outside with stone and on the inside with stone because you've got to make your southern wall very well insulated in New Zealand in the winter. So we I took special care to change the wall design around the back of the house. And um, yeah, well, it seems fairly good in winter. The, these is, this is the solar hot water. Um, what's cool about these is, what I like, is I can adjust the angle of the panels. So I've got a summer angle, uh, the winter angle's on now, and I can tilt them up for the summer angle because the angle affects the efficiency. And um, yeah, I picked these up for 200 bucks and just built a frame for them. And um, they're really efficient, they're thermosiphon. You know, panels you get now, I've been fitting some with pumps and that, that, they're people who don't understand thermodynamics. And um, once, you, once you understand it, no, there's no pumps in that, that all works by nature of hot water displacing cold water and it rolls around in a circle one. Bingo. There's a lot to learn though to understand how hot things work, you know. Plumbers by and large don't understand. They just go, oh no, you just they're used to Lego now, click, click, click. <laughs> and, uh, it's bizarre, and I found this book, a friend of mine gave me this book called um, Theory and Thermodynamics and I I mean, it's probably going to take me 10 years to, to get to it, but I use that book to calculate things like pipe diameter and length, and if you make too many corners, you've got heat loss, and all that stuff adds to your efficiency. It's all home built, but it's, it's pretty techy in another way, and it's maintenance free. It's got a frost plug on the bottom there. I like it. You know, hot water is one of the easiest things to set up, eh? and houses to retrofit, you know? And, um, you know, space heating and hot water, that's two thirds of your power bill, you know? So, yes. Yeah, and it can last for a long, long time if it doesn't have motors and rely on power and all that, in my opinion. We've just bought a 
what's called a grid-tied wind generator system, which means that the power that is made by the wind generator will be fed directly into the national grid. Um, and so if we make more power from the wind generator than what we use, the excess we will get paid back in cash. Um, it's hopefully going to cost us 15000 all up, and we've waited for, for years until there was a system where we didn't have to buy batteries because and an inverter, and an inverter because the cost of those are really high, and then it only got a lifetime of three. ten years, yeah. and because we're low power users anyway, although we have all the power things that most houses have, um, because we're low users, it works very well for us. And um, what machines are you going to try and cut down on to? Um, I'd like to um, not use the fridge. The freezers, we've got two freezers. freezers. They're just about Which are used half for the meat. Mm. So if we could, um, we looked at, at having a community chiller, we, we, we tried to, mm. where you could have a big space because it's much more efficient to cool a bigger space with a lot of people's stuff in it that we could all contribute to the cost. So a community freezer, and then you could have your own small freezer, or maybe no freezer. You know, but you've got to be careful with some of these things. We've gone into it very slowly because we just thought that a lot of these Western solutions for power are incredibly energy intensive. You have to make the stuff. You've got to make the panels. You've, they don't last forever. They've got pumps. They've got this and that. And, you know, they're kind of rich people's toys, feeling better about themselves. There's nothing on the consumption end, you know. Everyone's saying, do so, this, yeah. retain your lifestyle, but make no changes on the using end. On, on so while we are getting the wind generator, we are also still are gonna, trying to decrease mm, our power usage And there's more constantly. of an to do it. It's a, admittedly, it's a money-making one, but um, <laughs> it, it has other spin-offs too. You, you know, you've got less goodies in your house that you have to maintain and run and be a slave to. All our water goes through a grey water system. We have a low usage water, low water usage washing machine, which we bought specifically. So and we have no water from the toilet, so the main water is from showers and from the dishes. And all of that goes into a reed bed, which um, goes into a little pond. So that pipe runs more or less alongside the house and out to the paddock. We wanted to keep the, um, the grey water treatment area away from the house, the smell, attraction of mosquitoes and that sort of thing. So um, believe it or not in that long grass there, there's a 10 metres, it might be 12 metres long bed of rocks, stones, and the grey water goes in there. I'm in, I'm now in the grey water system. <laughs> I'm in the reed bed and I'm looking for the stones. Maybe they're deeper than that now. Oh well that, oh yeah well I found them there. So so this needs a bit of a clean out, it needs to be over planted again, but the stones are here. So it's, it's about 500 mils deep of st in stones. You can smell a bit of the hydrogen sulphide off that, I suppose it is, yeah. So this is a fairly natural reed bed, it's just a hole dug. Um, the stones in themselves will change the quality of the water because you get you know microbes and oxygen sticking to the edge of a stone and just stones water passing over stones pretty cool and then these will transpire so they'll take moisture up and they'll take it some of these old plants like reeds will um, actually t even uptake heavy metals because they because they evolved in the, when the planet was evolving, you see, 
There are plants that will take up uranium and stuff like that. Amazing. And these will. These are amazing. They've got a straw and they'll... So they... I know they're using them, even council, uh, regional councils are using some of these water plants for uptake of, of nasty stuff. And then they'll cut them and then they'll burn the, burn the tops because they'll take the, the stuff into the... So they're really awesome. So this, we're nearly standing in the reed bed and then its outfall goes down into this pond. It's covered in uh, weed at the moment. But Some people are running biofuel off that algae. Um, and since this paddock's been closed up for a, a long time, um, there's, a, yeah, there's a lot of water birds in here. So that's quite cool. We'd like to plant all this out with natives, this whole area. Um, but you, know, you can see that stock haven't been in here for a long time, which is a good thing. Especially with the bees, they'll be getting all the wildflowers and the clover and that. So, Yeah, so we'd like to put in um, some more plants, hyacinths and so on that'll uptake a bit more nutrient but there's really nothing in our grey water system anyway you know we, we don't we're not putting anything nasty down the down the sink if you're putting janola and cleaning agents down there you've got to have a proper but our stuff technically could be chucked out on the lawn it's got food in there it might not smell that good but there's, there's nothing in there that's so we won't put anything down the sink. We don't clean brushes and put turps down the sink or anything. I hope most people don't, but we don't have any nasty cleaning. If people turn up with weird shampoos, we tell them, look, would you mind, we've got some organic ones that are not full of all the other stuff that's gonna kill water life. I mean, we've got frogs, the things live in there, so. Frogs, we've got frogs here. Frogs are, you know, they're sensitive to that sort of stuff and they just won't be here. If, if, um, if there was something horrible going down there, so it's good because these systems make you aware of what goes on at the start. You don't just push a button and stuff goes away. You know, I like that. I feel more connected to to the earth that supports me. You know, and that's a good thing. We're in the compost toilet now. This is a really I've built three or four compost toilets for other people. We had an electric one, and this is the ultimate one. A bucket with sawdust in it. Warehouse bowl, lid cut off a warehouse bowl, stainless steel, lid bought from a second hand shop, finished. The other ones I was going to have an air vent in here but we don't need it because if you put sawdust on it it doesn't really have any bad smell so that's it. You just got to have the right mix of carbon and nitrogen and everything will happen. All the thermophilic bacteria will just Go for it. And human crap is really good because it's uh, it's got a pretty good balance of nitrogen and carbon already, and a bit of sawdust or leaves or you know the way nature happens. We is about that. Could be even too much. About that full of sawdust. And these 13, 12, 13 back type of heat loving bacteria. Start going for it and kill everything and kill every pathogen in the ideal situation. They'll kill it all in under 48 hours and they'll turn everything into beautiful, rich black soil, which people find hard to believe, but that's true. So from the buckets there, they go out to a compost pile outside and um, it'll get up to 70 degrees. You know, you can hardly put your hand in it in the compost when it's really going for it and turns into beautiful soil which we then we work out just about half a ton of that of compost a year which is cool great resource we don't separate the urine it's all in the bucket and that just goes into the pile so that goes right down through the compost pile as well in 20 litres Alice my partner said I want to be able to move this so a 20 litre bucket full of water weighs 20 kilograms in there from a cardboard box. It's up to that weight and that's movable. Two of those are movable. Whereas anything else you've got to think how am I going to move that around? Yeah so it just goes in here and then we'll sometimes intersperse it with layers of um, straw just to put a bit of oxygen in there to keep and grass clippings and then that's it. Just leave it to um, do its thing and these are the, these are the compost 
worms here that are all through it. And they do the bit of conversion too, I'm sure, but yeah, that's really beautiful soil. There's no trace of what it was, you know. For, yeah, this is kind of really portable, handy, easy. This is what they're showing them how to do down in Christchurch, you know. And we could do it in any house in New Zealand. So we've got these bins all over here, all over the place maturing, and, and you get quite a bit as you can see. Yeah, so this one here may have taken up to six months, five, six months to fill up. Typically we're we probably use three or four of those 20 litre drums a week, maybe five. Yeah, so it's quite a bit of volume. And you can't tell that it's anything apart from compost, so it's mm. non-recognisable, which is great. Um, and then recognisable as what? Non-recognisable <laughs> as food. Yeah, <laughs> You know, it's one of the things you can do to make changes. Do your crap in a bucket. Yeah, it's one of my little kind of evangelical um, things that is um, about growing um, ground durable timber. We just don't mm. grow it. For fencing, you need a post like that. You can grow that in six or seven years, and that you can shove in the ground for a hundred years. But no, we grow pine in one year, and then we look at the pine, and we put it in the ground and it rots, so we'll, we'll lace it with chemicals, which leach out. So There's no will to, to, to change that. That's one of my things I'm really hot about, is that New Zealand could easily grow all its post, even organic orchards are allowed to use um, treated wood in there, and I think that's just outrageous, because I know I did some research just for my own peace of mind or for us about what happens to CC, you know, to what is it, chromium, copper, uh, arsenate in that's in, in, in pine, and it comes out of the wood and goes into the ground. And um, it travels in the ground and it goes. goes into the water table. Into the water table. Mm. And I don't like to do that. And um, even some of my quite hardened alternative or organic eco friends are I'm quite at ease with using it. Why have you chosen to homeschool? Yeah, good question. Why <laughs> did we homeschool? <laughs> well, you we guys? started off on the thing. Um, we, the children were born at home. They're all home births. We're trying to create, a, if you like, a world or live a, a world where um, life and learning are kind of seamless. And we, I really hate the separation of the family through the school system. You know, the, it's, a, it's an industrial revolution model that we've lived with for a couple of hundred years that people think is like water running down the river. It's not. Mm. It's simply a model that's become accepted as this, you know, but um, it's, it was to serve um, the workplace being separated from the, the family. The children aren't safe in an industrial work zone and they're excluded from it. My contract with one of the people I work for says no children allowed ever. You know, I find that shocking to me now, but I, I realise I've seen it before. It's quite normal. Mm. I also wanted to be around watching my children grow up. I didn't want to see them at five o'clock naked. I'm stuffed, I've been working, they're stuffed. When do you see your own family? When everyone's tired. Or maybe in the morning if you're lucky. And I thought, no, I want the best time to be with my kids. So mm. we put a lot on the line for those decisions, really. Mm. Um, and there are, as you can imagine, sacrifices you have to make. But also, it's, your, it's a very exciting kind of a journey with them because you see, oh. I I had never taught a child to read. I'd never been involved in the very beginning of that stuff, and thought, actually, I'm just going by the seat of my pants yeah. really a bit here, and by intuition. But I also have um, a belief that people will learn when they're ready, and, and sure I enough. just see 
when they're really, they just learn. Toby at the moment really wants to learn to read. He also wants to learn Dutch. He wants to learn maths. He, he, he just wants all this stuff. So he will come up to me and ask for it. At different stages, I've all really loved doing workbooks. And then after about two weeks, <laughs> that they've had enough of them and then they will go on. That has that satisfied yeah. that bit. But I have seen from year to year, without any formal teaching, they can something that is difficult in a workbook one year, the following year with no formal teaching, they'll just say, oh, that's easy. And I'll remind them, actually, you found that really difficult last year, and when did you learn this? Oh, I don't know, but I know how to do it. So actually, I think what's happened in the school system is a lot of those things have become artificial, what we're seeing as natural progressions have become, they've said this is what happens yeah. then and then and, if, and then. And if we don't install it, 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 it won't, won't happen. happen. But actually it does happen. There's a lack of understanding, knowledge and wisdom about education and how people learn and what environment they do learn in. And it's also been very interesting just observing Ben and Toby are both a lot earlier wanting to read than Ina was and yet that's the opposite of what they say about school. Ina wasn't particularly interested, whereas Toby really wants to, and he goes and gets books that he can, you know, that mm. he wants to read. And Ben also learnt a lot earlier.